A couple of weeks ago, in the midst of the mid-election buildup, news broke that this administration was, taking, was planning to take yet another drastic step towards stripping trans people of their rights and human dignity. It's not the first time this has happened. It seems like trans and gender non-conforming folks are always pretty high up the list of easy targets. But this time it felt like something broke. Sitting at my desk, scrolling through my Facebook feed, I read post after post from my friends and my colleagues, full of grief and fear. It was overwhelming. And even in the aftermath of Tuesday's blue wave, it's still overwhelming. Maybe this is your reality as well or the reality of someone you love. Or maybe the thing weighing heavily on your heart this morning is something else. The news about climate change, the voter registration purges, the forest fires, the communities reeling in the wake of another mass shooting, the relentlessly ticking clock marking the number of days it's been since families were separated at the border. Or maybe it's something much closer to home. It's that parent who's started to forget things. That diagnosis that wasn't what anybody was hoping for. Or the number in your bank account that is definitely lower than the utilities bill that's due at the end of the month. In moments like these, it can feel an awful lot like being in the wilderness like wandering in the desert. Even with the bright spots, it, with everything happening in the world, it can feel sort of like we're in a hope drought. Maybe you feel that too. It's certainly how the psalmist's community felt. High on sorrow, low on hope. Despite the celebratory language of the opening stanzas, once we're situated in the text's present, there's actually a fair amount of weeping going on. The psalmist describes their situation as the watercourses of the Negev, empty stream beds in a dry, deserted region so parched that it was thought incapable of sustaining life. They too are in the middle of a hope drought. But this is not a song of sorrow. It would be easy to see how it could be, of course. There are plenty of psalms of lament in the scriptures, songs that cry out to God, naming the suffering, raging at injustice, pleading for intervention, demanding, how long, O oh God? And those psalms are necessary and important. But this is not that psalm. This is a song of survival. It's a resistance song. The author of the 126th Psalm sees her community struggling and suffering, and she responds by meeting them where they are and providing them with practical tools. Yes, the landscape is arid. Yes, the light seems dim. But this morning's scripture has something important to tell us about how we get through the hard times. And it offers interconnected strategies for doing so. Those strategies are witness, work, and prayer. Witness, which functions as a countermeasure to despair and isolation. Work, which we engage in as a practice of faith. And prayer, which is both foundational to and informed by the other two. These are the tools necessary for survival in a wilderness where small pools of hope are in danger of evaporating into the relentless heat of trauma and oppression. Witness, work, prayer. Let's begin with witness. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then, our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, 
The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we rejoiced. From the very first line, the psalmist is laying the foundation necessary for survival by reminding her community of God's faithfulness in their lives. She looks back over their history, identifies another time when hope felt scarce, and then tells them again the story of a moment when God turned their mourning into dancing and brought wholeness to a community that had given up hope of restoration after enduring 70 years of deportations, forced migrations, and state-surveilled detention in the Babylonian exile. God has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. This is witness as resistance, as memory-keeping, and as sacred duty. This kind of storytelling lays the groundwork for survival in two very important ways. It counteracts despair, and it shatters isolation. Witness is important because it counteracts despair. The act of witnessing to God's past faithfulness in our lives directly addresses the places in ourselves and in our communities that are most likely to be struggling. We know that grief, and exhaustion tend to encourage tunnel vision and forgetfulness, and those are exactly the things that rob us of hope. So we tell stories, stories of freedom marches, counter-protests, and everyday miracles. We celebrate historic firsts, we speak the names of those who got us here, and we lift up those moments, big and small, that are precious in our lives, like prisms, to catch the light. We do this because, as historian Hugh Ryan says, if you don't know your past, you can't believe you have a future. Witness gives us perspective as a countermeasure to despair. Secondly, the act of witness shatters isolation because to witness requires more than one person. Keeping history alive and present is both an individual and a communal act. When we come together in community to share stories of God's faithfulness to us, we build solidarity, we strengthen support systems, and we foster an environment where hope can take root. Witnessing gives us an opportunity to be less alone. Not only does that communal witness counteract despair and shatter isolation, though, it also provides impetus for the second strategy this psalmist describes, work. Now, you may remember that in the second half of this hymn, uh, there is a significant amount of sorrow and weeping, and I don't want to downplay the importance of grief, especially in times when things seem bleak. After all, even Jesus wept. But what's remarkable about the psalmist's community, I think, is that even as the people weep, they continue to do the work. They go out carrying the seed. They go out sowing. And this, says the psalmist, is how we survive. We can grieve, we can weep, but we have to do the work. Even in the desert places, even when it might seem pointless, even when hope feels like more than we can muster. Because planting is fundamentally an act of faith. We plant seeds, Cardinal Dearden said, that will one day grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are the workers, not the master builders. The ministers, not the messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. In times of hopelessness, the psalmist says, we still have work to do. Because the work is an act of faith, Faith that we have because we know our history and we have not forgotten God's covenant with us. 
Faith in a God who brings justice, who is interested in our survival, who is on the side of the oppressed and the stranger, the creator of all living things and the lover of our soul. Faith in a God who provides for us in the desert, a God who shows up and who has the potential to change the world at any moment turning seeds of sorrow into armfuls of joy and gladness. It reminds me of that Curtis Burrell song, I Don't Feel No Ways Tired. You know that song? I don't feel no ways tired Come so far from where I started from Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe God brought me this far to leave me. I'll say it again, I don't believe God brought us this far to leave us. And because of that, we are called to do the work. Because when we work, middle family, when we do the work of justice, the work of love, when we organize, when we march, when we reach out to our neighbor and stand in solidarity, when we call and call out our legislators, when we host a meal, when we encourage one another, even in the face of overwhelming odds, that, says the psalmist, is also prayer. Prayer is active. Prayer is transformative. Prayer puts things in perspective. Prayer is the framework in which the entire project exists. Prayer is the linchpin that holds together our witness and our work. There's not a separate section of this psalm dedicated to prayer. Instead, it is woven throughout the text when the people laugh and sing, when the nations engage in call and response, when the people go out to sow, when the psalmist calls for a new reversal of fortunes, prayer is an ever-present reality. By infusing everything with prayer, the psalmist shows us how critical it is that we not separate prayer from witness and work. Without witness and work, God becomes like a genie, a wishing well, a magic talisman without the prayer, uh, without the witness and the work, the prayer is simply I want rather than a conversation. And as Philip Yancey says, we cannot simply pray and wait for God to do the rest. We are called to be active participants. Prayer is a conversation with an ever present God a place where we bring our laughter and songs and also our doubts and fears, and in the faithful act of bringing them, begin to see ourselves transformed. Friends, we are living in hot mess times, and it is easy to feel like the world is short on hope. When we started, I told you a story about grief and fear and despair, but that's not the full story. Because you see, in the aftermath of that deluge, on Saturday, I found myself in the social hall of a New Haven UCC church, surrounded by hundreds of trans people and our allies. More people than I even thought I had in community. And we came with signs and banners. We came with coffee and food. We came to stand together and bear witness to one another to the hard things we've survived and the work we have done and the sharp, sparkling, impossible creatures we have fashioned ourselves into in moments of transformation. Resilience, defiance, survival, creation. We will not be erased. We will not be defined. We will not be crushed by petty tyranny. We will survive. <laughs> Beloved, these are hot mess times, 
but we will survive because we believe in a God who is interested in our survival and who is at every moment capable of making the world new. And so it is as we are in this moment. Let us witness. Let us work. Let us pray. Amen.